Now on BBC One, a change to the schedule as a galaxy of stars salute the brightest in the sky at night. You know, gentlemen, yes. there is one place from which you can see not only Mars and Venus, but all the other heavenly bodies. Oh, where is that, may I ask? I'm delighted you asked me that, because I'm going to show you. <laughs> There's no one else who's been Mr. Astronomy throughout all these years, except Mr. Patrick Moore, Sir Patrick Moore. He was a great conveyor of enthusiasm and enjoyment. He just happened to be that his subject was the stars. It could be that uh, somewhere in the universe, some being at this very moment is looking at a television screen and seeing. Well, good evening and welcome to the sky. Now, pay attention because I've got my eye on you. He was a TV icon. You didn't watch the sky at night for the astronomy. Of course, you won't see Vega looking large because no telescope yet built will show a star. It's gone, anything except point of light. Is it gone? Oh, no. Just as I got it on the crosswires, it blacked right out. How absolutely typical. There's nothing we can do about it. Patrick was a great eccentric, and he played on his eccentricity. And it's why I think he became such a household name. We have really exciting news. Halley's Comet has been sighted for the first time in over 70 years. Of course... People who had no interest in astronomy began to learn and become interested, and because of his own personality, they actually look forward to seeing this crazy man on TV. Good evening. Well, I'm afraid Burnham's Comet turned out to be something of a disappointment. Quite a number of people wrote in to me to say that they'd managed to see it all right, but it didn't really come up to expectations, and remember, I warned... Sir Patrick Moore was Britain's most famous astronomer. A much-loved eccentric, he was a fixture on British television since 1957. I can't, incidentally, resist quoting one letter. Watch from 12 o'clock to 5 o'clock in the morning. Meteors from the sky, none. From the wife, plenty. He inspired generations of astronomers, and I was one of them. He was also a prolific author, an accomplished musician, and a keen cricket player. I was actually hit for, for, for an 11. <laughs> an 11? <laughs> yes. Wretched man hit the ball into the outfield, it went into a rabbit hole, and the fielder forgot to call lost ball. By the time it was found, they'd run 11. <laughs> Born in 1923, Patrick became hooked on astronomy at the age of six. An only child, he was educated at home due to a weak heart. And when war broke out, he lied about his age, faked a medical, and joined the RAF, serving with Bomber Command as a navigator. You were on active service in the, in the war, weren't you? Oh, well, I potted around, not doing very much. I claim to be the only pupil navigator who was pinpointed Bristol when he was actually over Norwich. <laughs> war changed Patrick's life in several ways. His only girlfriend was killed in an air raid shortly after they were engaged. He never married. We were both 20. We had planned to have a son. He never got started at all. Mm, no, he no. would have been 60 now. <coughs> oh, was it? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I'm a bachelor. And that's why, and that really is why you're a bachelor to the oh, first. Of course it is. Yeah. These things happen. You've got to make, make the best of a bad job. Mm. If you're not there, that's, that's it. He never really got over it. Um, he said that, you know, there was never another woman for him, but he never wanted another relationship with a woman like that. He said, you know, that was, that was it, that was his one love, and he didn't want another. After the war, Patrick turned down the state grant he needed to take up a place at Cambridge. Whilst working as a teacher, he pursued astronomy in his spare time. You call yourself an amateur astronomer. I think a lot of people would say that you're being unduly modest. No, not a bit of it. My only role in astronomy these days, if I've got one at all, is that I do a bit of observing here and there, uh, and I've written some stuff, and uh, all I can try and do really is to try and egg on those people who can do far better than I can. Nonetheless, in 1953, he mapped the surface of the moon to produce the most comprehensive atlas of the time. It was Patrick's uh, map which helped the Apollo astronauts um, to land on the moon. It was a guidance for the uh, Russian space program as well. And so this amateur project that had its origins in casual sketches of the, of the moon then became this shot in the arsenal for NASA and the Russian space agency to do their things. Patrick was very proud that the work that he did had this real fundamental importance.
in astronomy. In April 1957, Patrick was asked to front a new television series about astronomy, and the sky at night was born. Good evening. It was a great treat, because it was only on once a month. Mercury and Venus and Mars are all so badly placed that, to all intents and purposes, they are out of view altogether. And that Patrick had a liveliness that just wasn't on a lot of television then. Jupiter's making quite a brave show, and you can see it in the southern part of the sky late at night. You felt you were members of a sort of secret society late at night, and Patrick was the head boy <laughs> guiding us through everything. First of all, here's a globe to represent Uranus, and here's a globe to represent the Earth on the same scale. And you can see there's a very considerable difference. I have a vivid picture of Patrick staring very intensely out from the screen. And it was riveting. It was just absolutely riveting to say, you know, this is what you can see. And if you go out there, you can actually see this in the sky. Uh, Saturn never has been shown on direct television before. Of course, it is a difficult object. Uh, please don't imagine that you're going to get as large and as detailed a picture as that very fine drawing that appeared in the Radio Times because that was a drawing, and it's a very different matter indeed from getting an actual picture on the screen. There it is, yes, and there is Saturn for the first time on direct television. You can see the ring... I was fascinated by astronomy as a kid, and I think really it came from seeing Patrick on the sky at night. It awakened in me this absolute joy of looking up into the night sky, which I still have. I still have this childish awe looking at the stars, and I actually decided that rather than be a train driver, I would be an astronomer. That's really what I wanted to do most in the world, alongside music. The Sky at Night started broadcasting at the dawn of the space age. For those like myself who were children in the 1950s, space travel was something futuristic, which really uh, belonged on the cornflakes packet rather than anywhere else. Um, and of course, it was the Sputnik in 1957, which made this a reality followed quickly by uh, sending up the first people into space. You know, if I'd come on the air in 1957, when we did the first of these Sky at Night programs, and said that within five years, I'd be showing you pictures of the first man to go round the Earth in orbit in a spaceship, well, I think you'd have regarded me as mad. He perhaps was born at the best time possible because he saw incredible development throughout the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st. Well. Patrick Moore, what did you think of that? Quite incredible. Uh, one thing you've got to bear in mind, I think, they were magnificent pictures. I'm not going to say they show us more detail than we've got from the orbiters, but they probably do. This has been a fantastic few decades in astronomy, and um, uh, Patrick had the joy to be able to report on it all. We have a liftoff, 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. The moon landing, obviously, was such a huge thing for Patrick, because there, his moon that he's been studying in his telescope all these years, suddenly there are people walking on it. Well, this is the moment, if there ever was a moment, for Patrick Moore. Well, I really feel absolutely overcome. I've lived with this idea all my life. Now that it's really happened, I can hardly believe it. No admiration can be too great for those magnificent men who have brought this strange spidery module down on the moon. And this obviously is a moment that humanity is never going to forget. I think he was rather sad, as we all were when the moon landings finished. But I remember the, a marvellous Sky at Night programme that he did um, with the last man on the moon, Gene Cernan, commander of Apollo 17. And you really got a feel for what it was like to be there. What about navigational problems? Do you have any? We studied, uh, due to a great deal of your work, of course, <laughs> on, uh, on the mapping of the moon, uh, we studied the area we were going to land so well that I really believe I knew it, at least from the air, from above, as well as I know my own backyard. I was rolling on the moon one day In a very, very month of December Now, May, May Oh, what a nice day Oh, funny there's not a cloud in the sky I think Patrick's enthusiasm and his passionate account of what was happening on the moon really added a lot to our perception he was able to interpret that for us and make it seem real, make it uh, actually something we could understand.
the way he came over as this great enthusiast, this fast talking, this person who was bubbling for the subject was just the same as he was in real life. He almost saw it as his role to be, if you like, the Mr. Astronomy, the man who would try and encourage new generations of people to take up an interest in his subject. He had this instinct, this sense to pick up young people, and I was one of them, and to, to get them into astronomy, to realise their enthusiasm. And he'd sort of nurture us. Back in the 1960s, when I was about to go into a career, I couldn't work out what to do. I was a keen young amateur astronomer when I was about 10, but I'd, I'd given it all up for, you know, rock bands and boys and the usual kind of stuff you get into. Heather, let me ask you one direct question. Do you think yourself there really is a black hole in the middle of the galaxy? I won't be positive, but I do think it's the one object which, at the moment, fits all the observations. Well, you could be right. Let's go and look. I'm game if you are. Right. My mother actually said to me, why don't you think you'd become a professional astronomer? I said, well, I haven't a clue what to do. She said, why don't you write to Patrick Moore? Well, we told you it was like science fiction. Good night. And I wrote to him and I said, I would think of going into professional astronomy and put a PS at the end. I'm a girl. Is this a handicap? Couldn't believe he replied to me. It says from Patrick Moore. Dear Miss Cooper, many thanks for your letter. Let me assure you on one point. Being a girl is no handicap at all. I just thought that generosity of spirit was fantastic. It really urged me on to try for a career in astronomy. Does this help? Let me know. I will do everything I can to be of assistance. With all best wishes, yours sincerely, Patrick Moore. Amazing. Patrick responded to thousands of letters on an old-fashioned typewriter, which he refused to swap for a computer. Most of the keys didn't work, drove many publishers completely berserk. You would hear the typewriter going, and probably six times out of ten he was answering letters, often um, from small boys or girls who were interested in astronomy, and he replied to them all. It was almost sacrosanct. It was something that he consistently did right up to the time when he could hardly type. When I was a schoolboy, I joined a local astronomical society and Patrick made monthly visits to the society. I was um, from a working class neighbourhood and to be able to see through the chink in the curtain to life beyond, that was something which I valued enormously. Patrick, right up to his final years, was um, enthusing young people. He never married, of course. Um, I, in many ways, we were all his family. We'd phoned him up and said, you know, we're a couple of boys at the local grammar school interested in astronomy. Can we come and look through your telescope? And he said, oh, please come down next clear night. I was a very short lad and couldn't reach the eyepiece. And Patrick lifted me up to the telescope. And the very first thing I looked at through a telescope was the planet Saturn. And it was just so beautiful. I was just utterly transfixed. I'm walking along the rim of one of the most remarkable places in the entire world. This is Meteor Crater in Arizona, a huge gaping hole in the ground over 4,000 feet across. Just look at it. The Sky at Night was commissioned for only three programmes, but under Patrick it went on to become the world's longest running TV series with the same presenter. The reason why people watch your program is as much for you. Yeah. Oh, it is, Patrick. This it's your true. It is your performance. Am I not right? Is it not the performance as much as what he said? <laughs> Thank you. Because people are fascinated by the way that you tell them things. <laughs> now you can't deny that you're being modest. No, I'm not. It so happened that when astronomy became, when I say metaphorically down to earth, and this was really in 1957 when the space age started, I was just the person who was doing it. So there I've stayed. But astronomy is a fascinating subject, and if somebody else had been around at that time, they'd be on the air now, and they'd be sitting here talking to you, not me. This month's sky at night is about the distances of the stars. He did fill the screen and he spoke machine gun, um, rapid, but articulate and entertaining. Will you please close one eye, doesn't matter which one, and then hold up your finger and line your finger up with my nose as you see it in the television screen. Got that all right? Now, without moving anything, use the other eye and you will see that my, your finger is no longer lined up with my nose. And if you keep everything quite still and flick your eyes around like that, you will see your finger apparently flashing to and fro. 
it was the sheer quirkiness of Patrick that really invited people to, to want to watch him. Well, the tides, as you know, due to the influence of the sun and the moon. And when they pull together, as they're doing at the present moment, uh, the pull is added, you see, and we get high tides. Granted that the forces are enormous, just how big are they? It's absolutely tremendous. There's no doubt at all of it. The force of the tides is the biggest natural force in the entire world. As a communicator, he was a supreme professional in that you could stand him up in front of a camera, ask him to talk with him without hesitation, deviation or repetition for two and a half minutes about some subject. He could do this perfectly, convey a lot of information. He could do it even if it was some new discovery he'd only heard about a few hours ago. He was approached one morning by CNN uh, to do a broadcast for them. They said, look, the, the person we would do an interview has dropped out. Would you mind doing an interview for us? And he said, no, not at all, not at all. And they said, um, uh, how long will it take you to write the script? And he said, script? He said, I don't work from a script. But there is one world, apart from the Earth, where we can be quite certain... Patrick was a perfectionist, but the downside of that was if it all went wrong, he got terribly frustrated and started making... using somewhat uh, loose language, shall we say, which had to be edited down to the recordings. Look at all that fantastic... Oh... I'm sorry. Blast and hell. When you watch yourself on television, uh, one always sees one's own faults very clearly. I yes. mean, mine, I know, I talk far too fast. I have to to get things in. I realise this perfectly well. But it's no good my trying to slow down. I mean, this is just me. Now, a lot of people have been writing into the sky at night asking various questions about astronomy. Well, of course, it is a fascinating sun. <laughs> and a lot of people want to know, why don't we put the sky at night on earlier in the summertime so the children could watch? Well, of course, we would put it on earlier. <laughs> We have to wait till it goes damn well dark before we do the damn at all. Patrick's character and style lent itself to impersonation. Uh, uh, welcome to the sky at night. I'm a very bad impression of uh, Patrick Paul. He was often being copied by many impressionists and co comedians, but I think it was the impersonation that Ronnie Barker did of him that was the one he loved. He really found that so funny. <laughs> Patrick was always laughing about how the, the orrery which they gave to uh, the two Ronnies to do the sketch. Um, they apparently broke while doing the programmes. I'm sorry to have to inflict myself on you like this, but Patrick, Patrick couldn't be here tonight, so he asked me to step into his shoes. And why not? He's always wearing my suits. <laughs> so here I am, and he asked me to apologise to you for not being here, but he had to go and show his telescope to the local town's women's guild. <laughs> if, if they like it, they're going to knit him a cover for it. <laughs> I think that you can both be prepared to sit up and gasp in amazement because I happen to own the ultimate in telescopes, perfected after years of research. Can we see it, please? Of course you can. Yes. <laughs> you just cast your eyes over that. The ultimate in telescopes. Oh, yes. A very fine piece of equipment. Of course it is. I'll tell you mm. something. On a clear night with that, I can see the bottom of the bed. <laughs> Many people, Patrick, might label you as being a, an eccentric. Would you object to that? Uh, Not in the slightest. I'm sure it's perfectly true. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, it a, is it a condition that you approve of? Uh, yes, I think it probably is. It's awfully difficult to tell, you know. I mean, does one nut think another nut is a nut or not? It's an interesting psychological point. There's something there, you know, for the psychiatrist to work out, and no one can be nuttier than they are. The eccentricity was something that he played on, but I think also it made, made him a very lovable character. Although having the monocle was something which he had, obviously, ever since he was a boy, um, it added to the air of interest about him. What about the real eccentrics, the flat earthers and the people like that? I mean, uh, how do you feel about I that? I have the very greatest sympathy for them, I may say. And after all, don't forget, many, many years ago, there was a man named Copernicus. And Copernicus said, the, uh, earth doesn't, the, uh, the sun does not go around the earth, the earth goes around the sun. And everyone said he was a crank. But of course, um, uh, the earth does go around the sun, at least I think it does. What does that mean, actually? That means, how are all you? I am very pleased to see you this afternoon. How did you learn these languages? These languages have been a gift sent from me from the actual people. Patrick's talking to this man who's speaking Venusian to him, and Patrick is apparently taking it very seriously, and he's being very polite. But Patrick was always very dismissive of, of anything which isn't pure science. One of these small spheroids chased us through the cops virtually. <laughs> 
and we tried in turn to chase it, and it just went along there at a terrific pace. This was no bigger than a soup plate. Uh, must have been a, a robot eye or a brain yes. beacon, yes. a thinking beacon, yes. which is sent down from the yes. cloud. I may well be missing something, I wonder. As well as astronomy, Patrick's other great passion was music. Patrick was a very good musician. You can see it is Sullivan playing, he's no fool, you know, piano playing as well. Talking about a man who probably could have made that his profession if he'd wanted to, but his passion for astronomy just overtook everything else. We talked about music quite a bit. We had some musical evenings and I always gave him our albums when they come out and he would always say well it's not exactly my cup of tea you know but I absolutely appreciate it you know and you know for choice he'd be listening to some of his own operas and classical pieces you know. Although he continued broadcasting in his late 70s arthritis forced Patrick to give up the things that he loved playing music and using his telescopes. Patrick had this incredible fast mind that was racing and yet the body was slowly deteriorating and it was so sad for those of us who knew him well to see this person who was so full of incitement and vigour still in a body that was just decaying around him. As he got older he could find humour even, even when he was really poorly. You've yeah. seen Haley's Comet both times haven't Haley. you? <laughs> When he was on, have I got news for you? He thought it was quite amusing to be the butt of a bit of humour. So where are we? Um, What's uh, the, they're, they're the sun, right? What's happened to Uranus? Patrick is always seeing the joke before they do, effectively sort of caricaturing himself. Do you still need therapy? He even did it for me. He did um, adverts for the air guitar collections, which I do, where he actually plays air guitar, gets into it and does this, you know. No strings attached. I think it's really great quality. Patrick was awarded an OBE in 1968, a CBE in 1998, and in 2001 he was knighted for services to science and broadcasting. When he got the letter from the palace, he was just so thrilled. And then, of course, to get the BAFTA award as well of the same year, and presented by Buzz Aldrin, the second man on the moon. I mean, this was such a thrill for Patrick. Not only has this man met every single lunar astronaut, he will modestly tell you that he's also met both the first man in space and the first man to fly an airplane. I'm pleased to say that this special award is being presented to my good friend, Sir Patrick Moore. Thank you so much. I must say, I feel really overwhelmed. There are so many people here who have done so much more than I have. After all, I have merely done some commenting. I did help, I suppose, in mapping the moon, but um, I have a sort of feeling that Buzz knows a bit more about the moon than I do. <laughs> all I can say is, I didn't think for one moment I deserve this award, but I am more than grateful. All I can say, therefore, is thank you very much indeed. It's been one of my great days of my life. Thank you. Although a much-loved figure, Patrick was not afraid of controversy. He was drawn to politics but never stood for Parliament, stating he would make a poor candidate because he always said exactly what he thought. He was incredibly patriotic. I'm sorry to say that he was also slightly anti-foreigner in some of the things he said, but he was always somebody who was very passionately doing whatever he was doing. Patrick wanted to see three things during his life. Claiming things stuck. Each a once-in-a-lifetime astronomical event. Halley's Comet, the transit of Venus across the Sun, and a total solar eclipse from Britain. Patrick had seen eclipses from all over the world, from Yugoslavia and Siberia in the 60s, and at sea 
off the coast of Africa in 1973. Obviously, one trouble is the fact that the boat's going to be swaying around. How do you cope with that? Uh, we made a, a homemade device in wood, which uh, is based on the pivots, so it'll move in both directions. It looked to me as if you were balancing the camera on your teeth. No, strictly speaking, it was on my nose, quite hard on my nose, like this. As the time drew near, the light began to go down very rapidly. Within a few seconds, the whole ship was plunged into darkness. And there's the corona, and there's a brilliant prominence to the side of the sun. This is incredible, the best corona I think I've ever seen in my life. Well, that was a breathtaking sight. In 1927, before the age of television, England saw its last total solar eclipse. And now, we can bring you our first total solar eclipse from British soil. The day before the eclipse, it was a beautiful sunny day, and we had this wonderful program set up, and then the day of the eclipse, we awoke. The weather was awful. Patrick was pounding around like a bull with a sore head. His producers tried to persuade him to see the eclipse from somewhere where he would definitely see it, like Turkey or where it would be, but he wanted to see it from England, his own country. I must admit, I'm excited, because I've been looking forward to this eclipse now for the last 70 years. All we need now is for these wretched clouds to clear away and give us a nice, clear sky. Luckily, the BBC had seen fit to have an aircraft getting pictures from space. On the whole, at the moment, I've had some really rather a gloomy scene, but don't give up yet. One never knows. It could still clear, and there's a slight lightning of the sky over there. And there is the crescent sun, and we've just had our first glimpse of the eclipse. And the cloud is there, it's drifting, and not very long to go now. Oh, clouds, keep away, please. And then there's totality, the diamond ring, and there the lovely corona. And that is the sight of a lifetime. From down here, sadly, we are still under total cloud, and we're missing it. That was so sad for Patrick, but it was an awful lot of fun to do because he kind of could see the funny side, even though he was bitterly disappointed. So at least we have been through the last English total solar eclipse of the millennium. Here at my observatory in Sussex, the weather is absolutely perfect. One of the rarest events in the solar system is the transit of Venus across the sun. Now we know the transit is about to start. Nobody has ever seen one before because there hasn't been one in any of our lifetimes. So it really was something rather exciting. There's the inner star, just first contact, a tiny notch, and there's no mistaking it now. This really is a one off. It will always be one of my greatest memories of Patrick. There, is that the black yes, dot? Yes, yes, that's it. 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 it was a perfect day, beautiful blue sky. As soon as the transit was over, it clouded over. So we had a gift from God, really, <laughs> that day. And so, from Brighton, where the sky, sky is now completely overcast, good night. Patrick good night. lives on in the minds and the memories of the people that he affected. Patrick's legacy is that he changed a lot of people's lives. And so it's glad to know that Halley is on its way back.